Welcome everyone to today's webinar on lessons from the global energy crisis. Before I say anything more, um, to remind our Russian viewers, uh, there is a function at the bottom of the page uh, to switch between English and Russian. So this webinar is brought to you by Aerial Group, one of the largest independent oil field services groups in the Eurasian area, providing well construction and workover services to major oil and gas companies in Central Asia, Russia, and the Middle East. The debate over the role that gas should play in the energy transition has been brought into... ...should be accelerated in light of recent events. Others caution that further investment in oil and gas is fundamental to delivering energy security and economic prosperity. In this webinar, we look at what lessons can be learnt from the unprecedented spike in energy prices. Joining this crucial discussion are Ronald Smith, Senior Oil and Gas Analyst at BCS Global Markets in Moscow. James Henderson, Director of the Energy Transition Research Initiative at the Oxford Inst Institute for Energy Studies. And Leonid uh, Grigoyev, Professor of, Mos of Moscow Higher School of Economics. My name is Joseph Murphy and I will be moderating uh, today's discussion. Viewers can also submit questions at any point during the discussion and they will be addressed at the end. Uh, please do so in the questions box rather than the chat box and specify which panelists you would like to answer. So to start off with, Leonard, if I could turn to you to kick off the discussion. Um, so we were talking yesterday about the theme of the webinar, and you said this should be better described as a European energy crisis um, rather than a global one. Um, can you elaborate on that? And in your view, what lessons can be learned from the crisis? Okay. Uh, first of all, there is no global energy crisis. We have happy recovery after pandemic and recession 2020. United States are okay. China more or less okay with some problems. It always uh, have problems, but never nothing mm -hmm. happens. Uh, so basically we have uh, European energy price problem, period. Uh, uh, considering globe of Europe is global crisis. And since uh, Europe is the center of the globe, uh, why the goal <laughs> is only in this sense. So we are talking uh, major, major problem uh, is that we have very early commodity cycle because recovery is industrial, global, industri global, real global uh, recovery is industrial. Uh, services in catering, um, entertainment, travel and tourism are still depressed by the coronavirus, by the COVID. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's industrial, early industrial recovery with uh, huge demand for energy. It's normal. All commodity prices up. Second element is the first recorded probably simultaneous uh, reduction of supplies of renewable energy. We have low water in Brazil and China. In China, it's very serious. Uh, China is taking as much as possible electricity across the border from Russia, plus coal, plus ga gas, and Gazprom is compensating uh, partially some coal which gone to China uh, on the internal market. It's additional demand for uh, gas inside uh, Russia. And we have uh, unfortunate uh, situation with hot summer and low, uh, low intensity of winds in Europe. It's the first decline of uh, wind energy. Uh, it's a coincidence. It's it's painful, but it's uh, as uh, would say uh, Clint Eastwood in in the movie Where Eagles There. It's I believe six, 1968. Said code, please next time code keep it all British uh, operation. Please keep it domestic European operation. It's for a start. Okay, so so low renewable outputts, and so you, I mean, you know, we we have seen reports of um, 
rolling blackouts in China, um, you know, other Asian economies are dealing with sharp increases in energy costs. But um, you would say that that's that can't be considered a crisis. The real crisis in is in in Europe. Yeah. Okay. So, so what I'm saying is the problems being experienced in Asia, you can't really say this amounts to a crisis. This is, well, you know, as you said, uh, a European no, crisis. E each country considers its own problem as a crisis. Uh, mm -hmm. China considers its problem as a global crisis. European considers its problem as a, a global crisis. That's understandable. Mm -hmm. What probably should be taken into account, one point in your list missed, is missing. Mm -hmm. uh, let me add uh, a bit of uh, information. The price for gas on spot market in the beginning of 2021 was roughly 100, 150 uh, after the hike in Japan. Mm -hmm. uh, since March to July, uh, the price already uh, had gone the way from 200 to 500, mm -hmm. to 500. And it was connected, as it's obvious, with the uh, diversion of LNG flows uh, from uh, United States and Qatar to China and to Asia. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe American export to European Union in March was about 3.9 BCM. In July, 1.3, three times down. Nobody mentioned any problems. It wasn't a global crisis. Uh, people <laughs> waited for better times, but it was uh, the uh, events in the fall of 2021 was based already on 500 uh, people. And um, as far as I understand, we, uh, we observe the decline of consumption of natural gas in the European industry, industry. In September, about minus 5%. In October, about minus 12%. And it's already... Uh, the decision was to be made much early than uh, for, uh, forwards of October. It was made probably uh, in August because of 500 uh, dollars per uh, uh, 1,000 cubic meters. It's unbearable price, say, for uh, fertilizers. Mm -hmm. So we observe the price blow on European industry, which is forgotten, absolutely forgotten from the picture. The idea of a cheap gas after liberalization was partially to boost the competitiveness of European manufacturing, uh, especially based on gas, uh, in mm -hmm. competition with China for obvious reasons, and the United States, uh, which uh, has cheap gas, but it's too far. It's too far when it's 100. But the 500, it's unbearable. So we have a very serious problem, uh, much more complex at least as I teach it to students, and as we discuss it in Moscow, uh, in the professional circles, it's, and I, uh, it's much less, uh, we here don't touch all the political and emotional side of, of the issues, uh, mm -hmm. but it's much more serious than just wind down. Uh, most of countries have had uh, some problems with winds before. I remember uh, Danish people presented in Moscow the graph of supplies of uh, wind energy in January. And we had four hours stoppage in mid-January, mid four hours. I asked, mm -hmm. what is it still in Scandinavia because we have perfect connection to Sweden, Norway, and Germany resources, wind resources. They said, no, 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 it's storm. Even a good storm may stop. Of wind energy. So the problem of coexistence um, of supplies of renewables, mm -hmm. the backup, whatever, I don't care what how, people can, uh, doing a very different thing for backup. For historical reasons, um, some fossil fuel works as a backup in many countries. That's, that's a real problem. So I, and now comes the transition and the transition new objectives for 2030 are very tough, very tough and very serious in terms of technologies and very serious in terms of required money. So, uh, so problem of uh, European Union now is obvious. You need to make the path for transition. Uh, I welcome it because 
I was the person who brought all the green ideas to the Ministry of Energy of Russia 30 years ago. <laughs> and I was the chairman, chairman of WWF Russia for years, and now on the board of trustees. So I perfectly support all the green agenda, but <laughs> I'm an economist. Let's count money and let's count uh, backups. For now, we don't have energy crisis for once in Europe, for one simple reason. There is no people uh, frozen. Energy mm -hmm. available. Uh, it's expensive, but it's available. Uh, since you, you put the issue of storages on the first line, I will put it in the last, but since it's the first, okay, first, it's the first time if, uh, when uh, storages ever uh, came to the picture of pricing. No, uh, it's American tradition to use, but again, it's market. That's people playing, uh, making money. Uh, we, we are genius this year. Uh, it's, uh, this story will come uh, in the history of economics to Kinderbergers in medicines as a uh, gas uh, Klondike of 2021. On the same level with Tulip, tulip Pyramid <laughs> in Holland in the <laughs> 60s. The 16s, uh, it's, it's, it's unbelievable how people created uh, the forward in October for November for $1,000 for 1,000 cubic meters in the situation there is no deficit of supplies. Nobody is frozen. And the only problem, it's low storage in the relation to some previous measures and problem cannot physically came uh, early than in three months. And there's a lot of uh, measures and channels to supply Europe by, uh, by energy till uh, uh, February. It's still uh, forward is coming uh, in uh, on, uh, October for November and we give up and say, oh, that's market, that's unbelievable. Somebody did something. It's, it's a huge, huge panic. In, in, but it is panic based of, on $500 per cubic meter. And from $500, it started to panic. That's probably enough for, for the introduction from one Russian. Keep it British operation. And James, if you could provide a, a longer term perspective on, on you know, what lessons should be learned from the crisis. I understand that you were at uh, COP26. Um, what was your sense of how governments generally position gas in their energy transition strategies, and you know whether that, you know whether their their policies are are, are set to shift um, in light of recent events. Um, thanks very much, Joseph. I think uh, to answer your question, I mean it was clear that one of the major focuses of COP twenty six was the phase, well, they hoped it would be the phase out, but it ended up being the phase down of coal. And of course, that's been a major theme in mm -hmm. Europe. And I think, um, you know, what has replaced coal in the short term has been gas. And that replacement of coal with gas, of course, and the phase out of coal in many countries, or phase down, dramatic phase down or phase out, has, of course, reduced the flexibility um, of the electricity system in terms of the backup for renewables in the European system. And to Leonid's point, I mean, whether we call this a crisis or not, it's certainly a global issue because, as we know, you know, Europe is the balancing market for LNG. And in many European countries, I mean, the UK, where I live in particular, have come to rely on the LNG markets for um, the, you know, as, as the source of, of flexibility. And of course, what, so what we're seeing now is a kind of combination of all these factors coming together allied with also the fact that Leonid raised around the increase of renewables in the system. And so, you know, the inter, I think the first lesson is, you know, clearly gas markets are interacting on a global, in a, on a global basis. You know, the problems that we have seen in China around coal mines, flooding, et cetera, other issues, increased demand for LNG in Asia have clearly had a feedback effect into Europe at a time when, there is less you know, coal backup in the system. So there's a greater reliance on gas in the system at a time when the wind didn't blow very hard for a significant period of time. And therefore was a, there was an increased demand for that backup. So I think that 
you know, in terms of what we're learning from the system, uh, I would say, and, and related to, you know, potential policies going forward, is that clearly we know where we want to get to at the end of the day. We want a decarbonised energy system, and that will involve a significantly higher share of renewable energy in the system. And when we get there, we will hopefully have backup in the form of batteries and other forms of storage that can provide the resilience to the system that we need. However, and I think this is one of the, I wouldn't say it was an overt message, but an underlying message from COP26 was clearly the transition is a journey and we're only hot, you know, some way down that road at the moment. Mm -hmm. And while we're going down that road, then gas clearly is going to have to play a significant role. And one of the problems we have right now is balancing the incentives for gas producers and gas-fired power stations to actually invest to be available to the system when we need them now, because they're obviously concerned that in the longer term, they won't be needed because the system will change towards to a decarbonized future. So I think mm -hmm. we are in the midst of this transition process now, which is difficult to manage, and which I think one of the lessons is, which will involve a significant amount of volatility, because... Um, you know, there, there, there are these complex issues which cannot be resolved necessarily on sh in a short term basis when external shocks occur. And we've seen some external shocks. We've seen a cold winter which led to lower levels of storage. We've seen mm -hmm. low levels of wind. We've seen issues in Asia which have increased um, gas demand. And of course, we've seen the overall theme of the recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic, which has also increased energy demand. So all these things have come together. I think, you know, if I had an overall lesson, it's that we are going to need and policymakers need to think about what the role of hydrocarbons, but particularly gas will be over the next 10, 10 to 20 years in this transition process and whether they can rely on markets or whether there's a greater need for long term contracting. Of course, there's been some conversation about, you know, strategic storage as well. I'm not sure whether that is the right answer, but at least incentivizing storage um in, in some form or other within the market context for the next decade or so at least while we continue to work our way through the, the transition process and move towards what we all ultimately want which is a decarbonized energy system so that's where i'd like to conclude for the time being okay and on a eu level do you do you see uh, do you see gas being do you see any kind of shift in to, to looking at gas more favorably. Um, um, so of course, you know, one, one thing that's coming up is, you know, the, the, the issue of, uh, of EU taxonomy of um, what, what is classified as sustainable. And I'm sure you've read the media reports that, you know, the EU is, is, is looking to, to classify gas and also nuclear um, as, as sustainable potentially. Um, and, you know, you have several you know, blocks of countries, um, you know, really pushing for that, for, for, for both fuels? Yeah, no, I think that, I think that is, that's an interesting question. I mean, ultimately, of course, gas is part of the problem, not part of the solution. I mean, at the end of the day, gas is a carbon emitting fuel. So I think that in the taxonomy, you know, it, I'm sure there'll be words around abated gas. I mean, there'll be some mm -hmm. form of gases, I'm sure, in the taxonomy. And I mean, it's an interesting debate around nuclear. I'm not a nuclear expert. I mean, I I think that nuclear will have an important role to play as well, uh, albeit with its own kind of obviously waste disposal issues. Um, but I think that, yeah, there, there, will, there needs to be a realisation from policymakers that gas certainly has a role during the transition process. I mean, there's always been this talk of being, being a bridge fruit fuel. And I think what we're seeing now is, is that issue writ large. I mean, at a time when... Uh, you know, renewable energy, wind energy particularly, has not been able to perform because the wind just hasn't blown as hard as we would like. Um, you know, gas is a vital part of the backup in many, many countries um, in Europe. And of course, in some European countries, we still have the coal to gas shift to go through as well. So I can see, I can <laughs> understand the argument. I think longer term, you know, as I say, unabated gas is not part of the solution. But the abated gas, I'm sure, is. And for the next 10 years, I think natural gas will also have a very important role to play. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, if I could go back to you, Ron, now, I hope that your audio 
has improved. We hope. We hope. Can you hear me at all? That is better. There's still a bit of background, but it's, it's certainly better. Yeah. I don't think there's anything I can do about it just resonating from the, the neighboring room. Um, so I apologize. I was trying to get a headset hooked up, but it just was, doesn't want to do it. Um, okay. Let, any, but let's start over. How would you like me to um, address it just going after taking a, a, a response to Leonid and, um, and the others or how? Yeah, depending on how much you were able, a, a, able to hear. Um, and also, yes, you know, what, to James with one ear and trying to figure out something else with the other. Um, <laughs> So let, let's go down to a few things. Uh, first, I find it interesting that they I had not heard that, that they, uh, certain parts in the European Union may be wanting to lab, uh, label nuclear and gas as renewable. Um, is, I think- Well, sustainable, but yeah. Sustainable, yeah, it's absolutely sustainable. Um, for an ex very extended period of time. I think one of the lessons that, that we're learning right now is that you can absolutely try to push a new technology too far, too fast. Uh, and I heard James mention that, you know, the winter, you know, got uh, surprisingly cold and the wind didn't blow. Uh, I did some work on this. And interestingly, that what we've seen in 2021 is a, a very large jump in demand in gas in Europe, about 40 BC. The, all of this can be put down to a chain, change in the weather that it got colder. As a matter of fact, uh, the increase in demand should have been 50 BCM, just using a regression, not 40. And I put that down to price increases. So there's, you know, the market trying to keep down uh, demand and, and succeeding to an extent. But when I, you actually look at the weather, all, all of this happened, you know, in the, in the first five months of the year, the weather did not get abnormally cold. The weather just got normal. Uh, it also didn't get, the, the wind didn't die to an abnormally low level. The wind became normal. It just so happens that 2018 and 2019 were abnormally warm. And even in 2019, I think, was by some measures a record warm year in Europe. Uh, it was also an extremely windy year. Uh, I went back and looked at 20 odd years of data, and there's a very interesting database. You have to kind of dig it out of it. It's made for scientists, not for cell side analysts. Um, but basically, wind speeds dropped so far this year about 35% to normal levels. So, in other words, what we've had for the last few years is a massive, in my opinion, a massive overbuild of solar and wind. It appeared to kind of sort of work because the wind was going much harder than it typically will. And suddenly we, we had, and meanwhile, coal plants are being shut down, uh, you know, especially completely in the UK. Uh, I think they've re uh, restarted one on an emergency basis. Uh, their, their nuclear plants, of course, have been shut down to a large extent in Germany. They're planning on shutting down two more, half of them at the end of this year and the other half at the end of next year without, you know, and plus shutting down coal plants. These are all baseload plants and they brought on no replacement baseload power. Wind is not baseload. Solar is not baseload. These are intermittent, means you can't count on them. Will, the only thing you can count on in solar and wind is that solar will not happen in the middle of the night. Everything else is uncertain. Um, and so I think what's going to be uncovered this winter, and this is where the lesson will get learned, is that Europe has gone very far down a, a road, too far down a road, uh, that it should have taken years to get to this point in terms of the build-out of wind and solar. And, uh, you know, as I started to say earlier, there was a, a German municipality put out an, a, uh, a, an online advertisement, uh, basically forewarning people how to deal with losing power and heat in the middle of winter. Showed a little old lady in her apartment freezing and, and she gets some candles and turns up a, an empty flower pot upside down and makes a little fireplace with them and tapes up her windows with the uh, um, uh, uh, with aluminum foil and invites neighbors over to kind of huddle up in, uh, in, in blankets on the couch and, and see it out. Uh, this may well actually happen this winter. Uh, obviously, that, that municipality in, in Germany is worried about it. And one thing that that uh, Leonida touched on was, you know, the, the uh, you know the, the political support of, for this and the fact that so far nobody has frozen yet it's very likely to happen especially if germany shuts off those two nuclear plants and on december 31st there's going to be a very large hole in their generation capacity that cannot be filled on any reliable basis by, by wind and solar or solar of course in, the in germany is, is minuscule beyond you know you can dismiss it out of hand wind the, the thing about wind looking at the data sometimes it blows very hard and it blow very hard for days and then it quits. And when it quits, it quits for days. 
Uh, this idea that we can, oh boy, let's get some, let's just build a bunch of batteries that'll solve our problem. The problem is you need to build an immense amount of, of storage and it needs to be able to hold the power not for a few hours. Uh, solar plus storage can do some things because you have a very lot, you have a pretty good idea what solar generation is going to be tomorrow. Yes, it can go up and down 40% uh, depending on cloud cover, but you generally speaking, you know it's going to peak and at noon and disappear at night. So you can, you know, manage that out of there with storage. With wind, you have no idea. And if if you're going to build enough uh, storage to make a meaningful difference, you have to build such an immense amount that you can carry massive oversupply, not from tonight to tomorrow, and but from this week to next week, or even more likely from uh, uh, this month all the way until October. Uh, and it just it it's, uh, stretches credulity that this will be possible and financial make any kind of financial sense. Uh, I think that you know Europe is very focused on shutting down coal. That should probably be their first uh, priority and then try to replace it with another base load, uh, nuclear. And I think we're already seeing movements in that direction. I will honestly be <laughs> very surprised. Zoom with okay. London. Yeah. Did we lose me? Yeah, yeah anyway. the connectivity ah. issues are coming back. And um, okay. yeah, quite, quite a lot of electronic um, interference um, at your microphone. Really? Um, Okay, I hear you fine uh, from my point of view, and I don't know what else is going on. Maybe we just have a poor internet connection here, but that is possible. Um, okay. Is it sounding any better at all right now? It's touch and go. <laughs> touch and go. Uh, yeah. Okay, I'm speaking about as loudly as I can, but if it's an electronic sound, it, it, it seems we're having a different issue entirely. Uh, okay. I tell you what, in that case, let's move on. I'm going to try to log on through a different uh, device and see if that doesn't work any better. Okay, please say yeah. Okay, so. Um, okay. Um, okay. Let's let, uh, maybe James, you you have some comments on what on on some of the arguments that, that Ron made. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think Ron makes a good point in, in terms of the kind of base load. I mean, I think the the um, yeah the, the look the wind issue was writ large. I mean, I'm just looking at some data here. I mean, there have been obviously on average. Um, we may have seen uh, sort of uh, 2021's the windy years, but certainly during parts of 2021, there were significant periods. And indeed, looking at the UK, uh, you know, significant periods, long periods of time when it was the least windy for the past 60 years. Now, it's these, it's these, it's these periods of time. It's not the average, of course, that matters. It's the peaks and the troughs that matter. And of course, the peaks and the troughs then require the backup to appear immediately. And that's what causes if you like, the immediate surges in demand. And I mean, Ron makes a very good point about, you know, getting rid of coal and my point about gas becoming um, the kind of backup in many countries because it displaced coal, for, obviously, for environmental reasons. And you combine that, obviously, with all the other issues that then occurred around the global gas market and our reliance on LNG. Um, and of course, the, the fact that Europe is only really the, the market of last resort for LNG. I mean, LNG tends to arrive in Europe when it's not wanted in what are seen as the premium markets in Asia. So this, the combination of this factors and the point that uh, you know we have become in certain parts of Europe increasingly reliant on renewables, and we don't have at the moment the storage capability to um, you know to to, to provide. Um, that backup for renewables and therefore we're relying on gas has, has all these factors have kind of come together to create the issues we have now. And I think the point being that, you know, in our reliance on markets, we, ha we have to accept and we will have to accept, I think, for a period of time that volatility in prices is going to be significant over the next decade until other forms of electricity storage emerge, technologies develop to allow us to essentially provide that backup for renewables that we need. But while gas is, is a major part of that, of that backup process, then we need to think very hard about how we incentivize both gas producers and, and, uh, and also gas-fired power stations to operate or to be available to operate um, you know, at, at times when, you know, renewables are not available. And I think that that is one of the big learnings. So I kind of agree to an extent with Ron, but I think, you know, this year has shown that, you know, in, in lo for long periods of time, there has been very, very low wind in Europe. And that has, it hasn't caused the problem. I mean, the problem 
was 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 developed clearly in the in the supply and demand of gas and the issues around cold weather recovery demand recovery post covid um you know demand rising very fast in in asia and lng supply being undermined by a few shutdowns technical issues um so it was it was mainly a gas market you know supply and demand issue but it was exacerbated by this issue around um the the, the lack of availability of wind for long periods in europe and the need for gas rather than coal to provide the backup although of course in some countries coal-fired plants have been turned back on um yeah. you know, notably in the uk uh, obviously which say, is yeah. not, not great for the environment but i mean it's been mainly the focus has been on gas with coal in extremis if absolutely required i mean i also agree with ron that i think nuclear you know it, it'll be very interesting to see what the ro- role of nu- nuclear does play but of course any strategy we have which involves increasing the use of nuclear is going to take a long time to implement so i still think we have a significant period of time where the mm-hmm. question around gas as the backup is going to be a very very important one and indeed, you're always going to have that issue of uh, public opposition to, to nuclear, um, which, you know, is, is always a big hurdle to, to you know, large, large projects. Absolutely. You know, I, mean, I completely agree. In Europe, in, in, in parts of Europe, you know, it, it will not return. I mean, clearly in, in Germany and Belgium, there are major issues around public acceptance of nuclear. I think as a global issue, I think nuclear will have a much bigger role in the energy transition. I mean, we're seeing in obviously in parts of Asia, particularly China, nuclear will have a significant role. So I think globally, the question around nuclear, I think, is still an open one. In certain countries, it's been shut off by the politics, I agree. Mm-hmm. But um, I think, you know, on a, in a broader context, nuclear can have a significant role um, during, you know, for its decarbonisation, um, you know, uh, role. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I actually have a friend who is a civil engineer, um, and he told me once that he had declined a job to to work at a nuclear uh, project. Um, but I thought it was very interesting that he has done other energy projects before. So he was quite comfortable working on a on a coal plant, and you know, even a coal plant and a gas plant, but not uh, not a nuclear facility um, because you know opposition to to the energy source. I thought that was very interesting, um, which might tell you a bit more about you know uh, the extent of public opposition. Um, So let's address um, the elephant in the room now. Um, So in a lot of uh, discussion of the energy crisis in Europe, um, in the media and among politicians, um, there there has been a lot of uh, blaming of Russia for for perhaps causing or or at least exacerbating the price, uh, the, the crisis. Um, I wondered if I could get your perspectives on that. Um, who would like to go first? Um, I don't mind. I, I, I'll give you a view if you like. I, mean, I, I think I think okay. certainly accusing Russia of causing the energy crisis in Europe is 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 uh, is very very far fetched indeed. I mean I think that's mm-hmm. that's clearly uh, not right. Um, you know there were there were many many market forces that caused the rise in gas prices in Europe. Uh, I think Leonid has already alluded to, and I'm sure he'll give us more detail on some of the internal issues in Russia in terms of refilling Russian storage, in terms mm-hmm. of meeting domestic demand um, that took priority. I mean, the, clearly Russia had a cold winter as well last winter as Europe, and they had, you know, Gazprom, as we know, has an absolute priority to maintain gas supply and available storage ahead of winter for the, for the Russian population. Of course, that's absolutely right and a political imperative. So I think that, um, you know, they certainly were not the cause of the problem. Of course, the whole, all the issues around Nord Stream 2 have created a political dynamic, which, is, which has created an opportunity uh, to, to, to try and blame Russia. But I think that's wrong. Um, I think, you know, obviously Russia has benefited from the situation. Uh, and, you know, just because prices have risen and, um, you know, I'm sure uh, perhaps Gazprom, has enjoyed the fact that there have been higher prices and has been able to recover some of the losses it made in 2020 in 2021. I think the question now is whether Russian gas is going to be increasingly made available now storage has been filled and domestic requirements have been met internally, whether more gas will be made available to refill storage in Europe and to make more supplies available for Europe. Mm -hmm. 
perhaps on the electronic sales platform. Um, it doesn't look like Nord Stream 2 is going to be approved anytime soon, given the latest delay announced by the German regulator. So I think the, the questions really are around, I think, what Russian, what, what Gazprom does from here on um, and whether it does provide more gas for the European market during November and December. I think blaming it for the historical events is, is not right at all, though. I, but I, I'm very interested to hear what Leonid's view is on that, because he's obviously got the detail from inside Russia. Sure. Uh, Leonid, please go ahead. OK. Uh, first of all, uh, you were absolutely correct, Joseph, when you mentioned politicians and journalists. No, no economist or energy specialist actually have any problems to Russians or Gazprom. It's absolutely quiet world on professional level. Uh, we have a lot of discussions. We have uh, economists. We have participating on the professional level. Everything is quiet. Point number one. Point number two. Uh, Europe consumes roughly 540 uh, BCM a year. Russia has 20% of European population and consumes 420 BCM. So mm -hmm. we are very close by size and we have one fifth of population, uh, one fifth of consumers. We are a bit cold the country and a bit poor country. So we question, and Gazprom has immense social function. It supply, not just extracts gas, it has, a, it has the obligation absolutely, absolutely undiscussable to deliver this gas from whatever place to cold north of Russia in this winter as before. So uh, you may say uh, Gazprom has two huge contracts. One is uh, supply Europe, let's put it first because it's a global Europe. It's a huge amount, it's half of European import, but it has uh, most of Russian supply, you, uh, we have here the offer, of, uh, I believe, of the book about Russian independence. It's just 100 BCM. Uh, the rest mm -hmm. is uh, Gazprom, and Gazprom must keep the functioning delivery. If any, uh, if any town in Russia is frozen in winter, it's not Russian supplies, it's Gazprom supplies, mm -hmm. and it's unbearable. Uh, so uh, Gazprom, uh, by the way, we, after the, all the devaluation, domestic price close to $60. So <laughs> Gazprom is not making big money on his domestic supplies. Mm -hmm. That's point number two. Point number three, uh, uh, who is, um, East Europe uh, is in difficult position because of the price high quits of this. On storages, the, the picture is completely different. Uh, Poland, for example, close to full capacity on storages. Mm -hmm. Italy, not bad. Uh, who is down? Three countries, Austria, Germany, and uh, the Netherlands. Believe me, they are completely safe. Completely safe. Of course, media uh, imposing on, on the population all the fears of the cold winter and whatever it was perfectly described here. Uh, but Germany and Austria, and they have long-term contracts. Long-term contracts have the capacity, reserve capacity of supply. They have different amounts. It's not just flat. It, it's a bit different uh, formal, price formula because it's kind of uh, flattening now. Mm -hmm. uh, because uh, probably they have about 50% of hub spot prices, maybe more. We have some forwards. Uh, but we have um, uh, uh, some piece of um, some ingredient, probably, I don't know, it's all these formulas, Te technically all formulas are secret, um, uh, some proportion of oil. So it's flattened. Mm -hmm. uh, but the reserve capacity, don't forget that, <laughs> we don't have too much, uh, too much fear from Germany, Austria, <laughs> we, 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 uh, gas will come. 
So it's not a problem of in uh, a full or full storage of Gazprom. Come on, it's not that bad, that bad distance. If you have a warm, uh, warm um, uh, winter in Europe, it's not a problem. If you have warm winter in Russia, we may use uh, Russian storages. But there is one more point. Uh, let me get back to the problem of reducing uh, consumption of uh, gas in Europe because for two reasons. One is switching to coal in power, in power sector. Mm -hmm. And second is reducing consumption of gas in the um, gas dependent manufacturing. If we have reducing demand for gas uh, from the industry, maybe from power sector, maybe we should reconsider uh, the, uh, the factor is about, I said, 18% of full storage to the full year consumption. Mm -hmm. But if consumption will be not that high, not, and not in the freezing houses, uh, but in the industry and in power sector, maybe we should look uh, carefully. But believe me, Germany is perfectly protected by long-term contracts. And <laughs> nobody is, is nervous. So there is no European storages. The storages are belonging to companies, to con uh, uh, countries, uh, Germany will supply it by countries. What, whatever happens, <laughs> as soon as Gazprom and Russia uh, operating in the normal, uh, normal situation, I don't see any problem on that side. Uh, I, uh, on the political side, I, I'm an economist. I'm avoiding as much as possible, um, hiding myself behind jokes and proverbs. Uh, the only proverb suitable for that case, you cannot have uh, cake and eat it at the same time. Let's, mm -hmm. uh, I would uh, suggest to calm down the media uh, because what happened on today's 25th, what happened on 60th of November? A German regulator delayed registration of uh, North Stream. Certification. Okay, I don't care. Okay, what happened? Prices jumped 16 percent. Check me, maybe wrong on the uh, uh, <laughs> on decils. Okay, uh, if it registered, that would be down. We, we presume. Maybe I'm wrong, but probably it would be down. Okay, if prices are jumping on non-registration, what do you have? For, what do you want from us? Period. Thank you. I'd just like to remind um, uh, viewers that uh, you're welcome to submit any questions you have in the in the Q and A box. Um, thank you, Leonard. Um, oh, if you want my answers on other questions, it's very simple. European Commission did everything well. European Commission never would recognize anything done wrong in any case, and will continue as it is. I believe it. Okay, um, Ron, do you agree with that? And what was your general perspective on, um, yeah, Russia's role in in the state of the market right now? In that sense, I and I hope the sound is better now. Uh, I agree with Leonid 100 percent that it, it's crystal it's, clear. It's, oh, okay, crystal. wonderful! I should have done this from the start. Uh, <laughs> go through the iPhone, not through the uh, the, the uh, <laughs> laptop. Uh, my thought on that is that, of course, it is somewhat ridiculous to blame Russia for the problems that Europe is facing now. The problem Europe is facing now is a combination of uh, you know, a natural uh, cycle and trough uh, situation in, in commodity markets and a lot of their own choices in terms of the energy conversion, which I think were a bit rushed, shall we say, to put it politely, uh, and practically nothing to do with Russia. But it does play very conveniently into Russia's hands uh, in the sense that obviously Russia, the Kremlin and Gazprom both would like to get uh, Nord Stream 2 uh, certified and, and launched. And it mm -hmm. just happens to be being completed in the, a year when suddenly Europe is finding itself quite short of natural gas. Uh, so it all works well, but I don't think 
that Gazprom has done a thing to make it worse, or at least if they have, it's been, if they've played on the margins, it's definitely been there on the margins. Uh, mm-hmm. The major problems are all pretty visible. And so far, they have met all of their contracts. So as Leonid said, none of the professionals have any problems. It's just politicians and newspapers. Uh, the, but to go back to the political point and, and to pick up something on the, in the first section, which I wasn't really able to finish, the, so far, the European, average European voter has been very supportive of the energy conversion, uh, the, the, the broad idea. I think this winter, it's very likely they're going to get tested in that commitment uh, because it's one thing to, to think about it in abstract. Yes, we'd all love to save the earth. Uh, it's going to be a completely another thing when they're sitting in dark and freezing up, uh, apartments. And uh, one thing I do have to disagree with a little bit with Leonid, I think there is very much a chance that, they, that that will actually happen this winter. And the low storage is uh, a good bit of the reason. Uh, and it won't happen early, it could, but it could happen late. So if we get a, a late February, early March, big freeze that settles over both, uh, both over Russia and over, uh, over Europe, Gazprom, you can imagine, will be maxed out in production. Uh, Europe will be pulling, you know, obviously producing all the gas it can, which isn't that much anymore. And they'll be trying to pull all the gas they can out of storage. Well, the problem is storage will be low. And the mm-hmm. lower storage is, the slower the extraction rate. And so it is quite possible that we'll actually be running short of natural gas. Uh, the, the big issue we'll have to find out is when this theoretical cold front hits, will the wind blow or not? If the wind blows strongly, it, they'll probably make it through. If, like last February, the wind dies along with this mass of cold air, then you're going to almost certainly see blackouts through Europe. Uh, it, it's, it, we're that, especially if Germany shuts down those two nuclear plants on December 31st. And at that point, I think the whole political situation could change quite radically. I thought it was interesting how quickly uh, the UK uh, brought up the idea and approved it, apparently over a weekend, uh, to start uh, rebuilding, you know, restart construction of a major nuclear plant that had been stalled and to suddenly commit to a number of smaller nuclear reactors. Uh, this happened mm-hmm. extremely quickly. I thought it would take months, at least, of debate, even once the, the situation became crystal clear. Uh, instead, they did it in a you know, day and a half or two days, apparently. I think that conversation is likely to be happening across Europe uh, come next summer, and we'll we'll see what happens. And you know, for you know, for God's sake, I hope nobody freezes in the dark this winter. But it seems like it it is a quite you know, it, there's a very good likelihood it will actually happen sometime in the relatively near future. It all depends on wind speed and, and temperature. Mm-hmm. I mean, you've said. Um... You've correctly said that uh, Gas- Gazprom is meeting all of its um, contracts, but at the same time, it's not it's not you know letting that extra yes. supply out on the spot market as it it's typically it doesn't have done. It. Uh, that's the so problem. that's that was yeah. my question. Yeah, do, do you think yeah, that apologize. Gazprom is at its production capacity? Does it have the gas to to send? Yeah. can it send anymore? Yeah, the numbers for October where they were producing about one point four four BCM per day. Their absolute maximum, uh, the company said two different numbers, uh, it's either 1.5 or 1.55. In either case, those are peak production numbers that cannot be sustained for any length of time. Uh, on a recent call, I asked them, you know, theoretically, if you're running at 1.5 or 1.55, whatever your, your absolute peak is, how long could you do it? And they did not want to commit to a number. Uh, it's possible they didn't know. Uh, but you have to imagine that when you're running at that level, you've turned on every old field that you're holding in cold reserve. This is this is a you know you re- retrain you retain your maximum capacity for that emergency when it's minus forty in Moscow. Uh, you know you had this massive cold freeze when demand from Europe is at its maximum. You have to meet those contracts. That's when that's why you hold this uh, maximum capacity. If you start running into October, it won't be there in January or February. Those fields are going to start declining. Uh, on my best estimate, Gazprom is probably running close to 1.5 already in November. There, I don't think there is any extra gas to put into the pipeline system and send to Europe right now. Mm-hmm. Okay. And, you know, going on a bit of a tangent now, um, one thing I thought, an in, a development which I thought was very interesting, and um, you and I have talked about this many times over the years, um, the issue of um, you know ending Gazprom's monopoly over the pipeline exports of gas mm-hmm. in Russia. Um, you know, so time and time again, this topic has come up, um, and it's never really gone anywhere. You know, the the Russian government has always resisted taking this step. Um, but I thought it was interesting 
Um, I think in a recent in interview, the Russian energy minister um, said that he supported uh, a bid by Rosneft to, to use the export pipelines, um, you know, mainly talking about Nord Stream 2. Um, but it would be up to the two companies to, to work out the details. Um, what do you think of that development? Is, is this a game changer or, or, or are we well, just seeing the same thing we, we've seen so many times? Yeah, I think this is a decision that's being held in reserve right now. Uh, when uh, it was Sechin, the CEO of uh, Rosneft, wrote a letter to Putin. I do believe it was Ju July or August, uh, once again, suggesting this, that they'd be allowed to, to export 10 BCM per year to Europe. Uh, yeah. Rosneft, for I think three years now, has had a contract with BP. Uh, to do just that. It's already got it pre-marketed. Uh, I do believe the prices would, it would be done at spot or one day forwards or, or some tied to market prices. And so they were once again asking to, to be allowed into the system. Um, and what Putin did was turned around and, and passed it back down to his ministries to say, I'd like to hear your opinion. Mm -hmm. And they've come back to him. And at this point, it's apparent, you know, quote unquote, is still under study. My assumption is, and I have no information on this, this is just merely trying to put two and two together, is that this is being held in reserve as a potential uh, concession in getting Nord Stream 2 uh, put online. Uh, it, it, I could be wrong on this, but it is possible that they'll say, okay, if, you, you know, if, if it's required to certify, we will allow some third-party access to Nord Stream 2 and let's negotiate. Mm -hmm. uh, so it is possible. If you had asked me the same question six months ago, I would have said that the chances of the independents getting any access are not zero, but extremely low in any 12-month period. Mm -hmm. uh, at this point, I think the chances are closer to 30 or 40%, which is significant. Uh, mm -hmm. it, also, remember, one thing that Rosneft has is two new fields that it's launching. Uh, the, the second and third stages at Rospan and then Haramburski. Mm -hmm. uh, these are two very large fields. They're going to, you know, add. I think in the next twenty, in the next 12, 24 months, ten to fifteen BCM of uh, at least of additional production capacity, uh, which is obviously they're thinking put some of that in the pipeline. But also, Rosneft each year has been the last several years has been buying Gazprom gas to supply its own domestic customers. Uh, that gas will go to improve the the Russian production balance, whether or not it's shipped directly to Europe or just indirectly relieve some pressure off Gazprom to allow it to, sit, to, to have more gas to ship. So mm -hmm. it, it's long story short, it's a political question. It, it becomes politically expedient to do so that it probably will be done. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, does anyone have any closing remarks? And I just ask you um, please to, to keep them r relatively, relatively brief um, just for time consideration. Um, I would suggest to make, yeah. the, to make the record, short record of what we said and mm -hmm. keep it, uh, and keep it uh, monitored once a month and we will meet uh, end of February in review. Um, James? I just suggest, well, well, the only thing I'd say is um, on high prices, um, at, well, two things. One, one I think um, it'll be interesting to see what uh, Gazprom thinks going forward in terms of filling the storage that it has. I mean, in terms of storage in Europe, uh, the storage that Gazprom is involved with is lower than other storage in Europe. So it'll be interesting to see whether Gazprom is in, you know, feels the, the need to fill up store, the, its, its own storage in Europe. Because as Ron points out, there could well be an issue in a cold winter or at a time when the wind doesn't blow. I think the other question I'd raise is, how long it's really beneficial to all gas suppliers, but you know, including Gazprom, for gas prices to be this high. And if you <laughs> can help to bring prices down, well, obviously in the short term, that's not good for your revenues and profits, but as a long-term <laughs> play, you know, high gas prices right now in Europe or in Asia, frankly, are not good for gas in the long term. They <laughs> create the incentive for politicians and consumers to say, let's get on with alternative forms of energy as fast as possible, because mm -hmm. look, gas is, you know, the gas price can go up by a factor of 10 in a very short mm -hmm. period of time. You know, we understand why that's happened. We understand it's market forces. It's not anyone's fault that it's happened. But if you have a means to allay that and to create a longer term incentive to carry on using gas, mm -hmm. maybe now's the time to think about it. So I just would throw that into the melting point as well as a final thought. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and even on a just you know purely commercial scale, uh, you know, the sustained high prices that that that's going to le- lead to some demand destruction. Um, you know, whether that's an ammonia plant or, or whatever, you know, anything else using gas as a feedstock or, or you know, a power source. Yeah, I mean, it'll, it'll lead to demand destruction in the short term and whether it'll lead to fundamental long term demand destruction from, from ammonia and fertilizer plants. I don't know. I suspect not. I mean, they just mm-hmm. say they can't afford it. They turn themselves off and they come back when they can afford it. But I think the fundamental point is, you know, you create the, the incentive, but as I say, for politicians and for consumers to think, over the longer term, you know, let's get out of gas sooner rather than later, because look at the high prices we have to pay. So I would have thought there must be some incentive if you do have some supply to get it on mm-hmm. the market and bring prices down to, you know, to keep gas in the mix for longer on a commercial economic basis, never mind the kind of the, the issues we've been discussing today. So mm-hmm. I don't know, we'll, we'll see how Gazprom and other suppliers react over the next few months. But if Gazprom has got some spare supply, then you know perhaps it might be thinking sooner rather than later about filling up storage in Germany and getting some more gas onto the market to bring prices back down to a more reasonable long-term level. Mm-hmm. Um, right, I, I was wondering where the questions were. So um, before I turn to you, Ron, we've just got one um, from Politico. Um, so on high prices, any thought this might create an opening for Qatar or others to jump in and grab EU market share. Um, but on sustained prices and incentive to switch away in the future, doesn't that bolster the gas business in their pivot to blue hydrogen? Um, any responses to that? Well, in term, I would just say in terms of Qatar jumping into market share, uh, if you follow Asian prices over the last, you know, months since we started to see this ru- insane run up in, in European prices, generally speaking, the Asian prices have maintained a premium. It, it, mm-hmm. The, the barb get has remained open, or at least has been at, at parity, such that no one's been incentivized to take gas out of Asia and send it to Europe. Uh, mm-hmm. So Asia needs the gas as much as anyone else. And so that there is a short, this LNG shortage is indeed global. Uh, 12 months ago, I absolutely would not have predicted we'd see this type of any type of real shortage short of 2023, it only you know only came two years early, uh, two or three years early, and I wouldn't have expected it to be this deep. But uh, it, the shortage actually started in Asia uh, back with the big cold snap back in December of last year. And mm-hmm. that started pulling gas out of Europe and when storage was massively overfilled in Europe just 12 months ago. Uh, and so this whole ball started rolling there. So I don't think that so it, there, there really is no a threat to bring that Qatar would jump in to take market share because they're getting more money to sending their their gas to Asia right now than to Europe. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so the priority remains Asia. Um, okay, uh, no in more questions. In terms of blue hydrogen, just to answer jump that in. question. Yeah, uh, blue hydrogen obviously has a problem because blue hydrogen is basically methane, uh, which is being transformed uh, into hydrogen and CO2. So, I mean, you know, the price of the price of methane being high is not good for blue hydrogen. Uh, mm-hmm. it, if anything, it incentivizes you to accelerate the production of green hydrogen, though there are a lot of issues around green hydrogen mm-hmm. in terms of availability of electricity and the size of electrolyzers and the cost of electrolyzers. But, but I think, unfortunately, a high price for natural gas is not good for blue hydrogen because natural gas is the main input to make hydrogen that we call blue from, you know, obviously steam reforming of methane. <laughs> um, okay, um, Ron, any closing remarks? Well, in uh, closing remarks, I'd like to go back to this uh, idea of uh, demand destruction for a moment. Uh, I, I absolutely agree that extremely high prices right now are some, you know, not good for the long-term health of the uh, gas producers. Uh, President Putin even mentioned it himself, this is not a desirable situation. And obviously, a thousand dollars per thousand cubic meters. I think uh, oil is, or its gas is now trading at a premium of like 140 percent to oil, instead mm-hmm. of a, a you know 15 or 20 percent discount, which is typical, uh, is obviously unsustainable. Gas prices are absolutely going to go back down and go back down a lot, just not this winter. Uh, and you know, there's also this basic idea that you really shouldn't bankrupt your customer. Uh, this is something Gazprom ran to and in, into in 2009, with uh, when oil prices raced through the roof and all of their export prices were tied to oil. Uh, we had the first LNG glut develop at the time and you could get LNG 
uh, well, not for a song, but it was coming in to get it dumped into the European market. And it was very easy to undercut Gazprom and its oil link prices. Uh, so Gazprom has been down this road before in a slightly different form. Uh, and speaking of contracts, uh, one of the things, and it might be worthwhile talking about uh, if we reconvene in, in February or March, is the state of European contracts. Uh, the, one of the main reasons that Europe is having such a huge problem with gas prices is that Europe over the last, well, decade, but in particular the last four to five years, has insisted on breaking oil link contracts and converting to, to, to spot and futures based contracts. And Poland just won that, very proudly won that case last summer. And now they're openly regretting it. Uh, it. I think one of the things we're going to see in as contract negotiations or renegotiations happen is the introduction of a wider variety of pricing mechanisms. Uh, I think there will be, there probably already is a rising interest in going back at least partially to oil link prices, uh, perhaps Henry Hub link prices, some kind of very, or even fixed prices, but just some kind of variation where you don't have uh, a huge bulk of consumers prices tied to the day-to-day -day trading mechanism uh, for natural gas. So I think that's some, an evolution we'll see over the next few years. Sure. Yeah, I definitely think it would be great to, to take stock in, in February. Um, uh, one short remark, if possible. Sure. Let me remind that European system, taxation system is very specific. Uh, households pay three times more than in input price. Three times more. It's mm -hmm. the same for gasoline, you know, but it's for gas. Uh, Gazprom was not allowed to be luxury retail market, uh, but maybe it's a, uh, a problem of customer, maybe it's a problem of household. Uh, but in this case, we'll get with taxes. Thank you. Good point. Um, so thank you to our panelists. And of course, thank you for everyone that tuned in to our webinar on lessons from the global energy crisis. Uh, this webinar is brought to you by Aerial Group, one of the largest independent oil field services groups in the Eurasian area. Thank you and see you in the future. Asia and Europe, the Arctic and the desert. We implement projects in the most challenging geological conditions. We successfully build drill wells in extreme temperatures. We penetrate down to 9,000 meters in the earth and we reach new heights every day. We are among the fastest growing independent drilling companies in the world. We are one of the top three Russian Federation market leaders. We are Ariel. Ariel specializes in horizontal drilling and the construction of controlled directional wells. We can work in extreme temperatures and abnormal formation pressure. Our experience in implementing projects in various regions around the world allows us to quickly adapt to new geographic, infrastructural and regulatory features of working in different countries. Aerial has offices and representative offices in many countries around the world. Aerial's drilling rigs are localized in places of active and potential hydrocarbon production and are concentrated in two areas, south and north. This makes it easier to move equipment and mobilize tool rigs for new projects. We have one of the youngest and most technologically advanced drilling rig fleets for oil and gas well constructions. From mobile to unique, super heavy rigs with a load capacity of over 600 tonnes. We efficiently invest in the constant updating of equipment. We are working on expanding the range of our capacities to meet our customers' requirements. Ariel successfully works with leading Russian and foreign oil and gas industry companies. They include Rosneft, Volkoil, Novatec, Gazpromneft, Gamal LNG, Achim Gaz, Uzbek Nefti Gaz, and Petronas. We carry out projects at the highest technological level and have worked for many years with reliable companies such as Halliburton, Weatherford, Schlumberger, Baker Hughes, and other global leaders of oil field services.
we adhere to the most stringent international standards in the field of industrial safety, labour protection and environment. Our strength lies not only in experience in the tool rigs. Our people are our main asset and wealth. Our team has grown from 10 to 8,000 people in just 12 years. And we remain united. A large team stands behind each drilling rig and each document. All kinds of people believe in the company, grow with it and love what they do. Ariel, with respect for tradition, care for people at the forefront of technology.